Welcome guys to today's video. I have something super interesting planned out, but first of all, I want to thank you guys for all the support, all the viewers, and all the subscribers. We just hit 100 subscribers with only two videos on the channel, which is absolutely crazy. So thank you guys so much for watching, and I'm really glad you guys are enjoying the content. Now today I'm not just going to be showing you some of my honeypot ants, which you can see right here. Actually, two of them are doing truffle axis right there, which means they're feeding each other. But I'm going to be showing you and describing an experiment I ran with these ants. And the results were completely unexpected. They're not what I thought was going to happen. And they're really interesting because it just goes to show that these ants don't always behave in the way we expect them to or in the way that makes sense to us. So I think you guys are really going to enjoy this. The findings that I found were really, really interesting. And hopefully it helps some of you raise some of your own colonies as well. So let's get right into it. So as you may already know, the species you're looking at right here is Myrmecocystis mexicanus. Myrmecocystis is the genus of honeypot ants native to North America, mainly the west coast of North America, so California, and then southern, southern coast of the U.S. as well. So that includes Texas, New Mexico, or Arizona is where these ants are native to. And the genus Myrmecocystis is divided essentially into three subgenuses. I'm not gonna bore you guys with the specific names, but there's essentially three subgenuses, and Mexicanus is in one of them. And then there's another species of Myrmecocystis called Myrmecocystis mendax, which is in another subgenus. Now this is a Myrmecocystis mendax queen. As you can see, she looks nothing like the Mexicanus we just saw earlier. While the Mexicanus were essentially all golden, this queen has an all black abdomen. Her thorax is almost pure black. It has just a tiny little bit of brown. And then the, this queen has a reddish brown head. Essentially nothing like the Mexicanus we just saw. The reason these ants look so different is because even though they're in the same genus, they're fairly distantly related. The genus Myrmecocystis, which is the genus for the North American honeypots, which we're talking about right now, is essentially divided into three subgenuses where Mexicanus is in one of them, and then this species, which is Mendax, is in another. What this essentially means is that this species, Mexicanus, would share more in common with a sister species, such as Navajo, which you can see right here, than they would with Mendax, since the Mendax are in another subgenus, so they're not as closely related and would have less similarities between the two. Here's where stuff gets interesting, though. A common practice among ant keepers is something called the brood boosting. What this means is that typically you give a fresh queen that's just had her nuptial flight, you'll give her pupae, which is what you're looking at right here, essentially baby ants that are about to hatch from an already existing colony to boost her. The founding period for queens is very hard. It's essentially the hardest thing they do in their life because they're responsible for raising up their first generation of workers on their own. So again, ant keepers will give them essentially baby ants that are about to hatch from another colony. That way the queen can have their first generation of workers without really needing to do any work since the pupae will hatch and she doesn't have to worry about feeding them, cleaning them, or anything like that. On top of the fact that you can help your queens be more successful if you boost them with pupae, the really cool thing about brood boosting is that sometimes it can work across different species. So for example, uh, Campanotis in the Northeast, there's Campanotis pennsylvanicus, which is a very common species, and there's also Campanotis chromioides, which is another fairly common species. Now, since these two species are pretty closely related, I could give a Campanotis pennsylvanicus brood or babies from a Campanotis chromioides queen, and once they hatch, they would be accepted into the colony. This is because once again, they're very closely related, and there's very, very few differences between them. So once the workers hatch, the queen would essentially recognize it as being one of his own babies since it wouldn't be able to tell the difference between this boosted worker and a worker she would be able to raise on her own. More often than not though, boosting across different species will not work since the queen will recognize that the smell is unlike anything she would be able of producing. So the queen will either eat the pupae once it's given to her or she'll wait until it hatches, and then once it hatches, it'll recognize that it's too different to be anything that she'd be able to produce, and then she'll kill the worker and eat that as well. However, I decided to try boosting some of my Myrmecocystis mendax queens 
with pupae from Myrmecosis mexicanus. Despite the fact that, even though they're in the same genus, the two species aren't particularly closely related, and the results were not what I expected. What you're looking at right here are some Mexicanus workers tending to some little larvae. You can see it right in its mouth, and there's a big pile of eggs in front of the worker. But these eggs are not Mexicanus eggs. These eggs belong to a Myrmecocystis mendax queen, which you can see hanging from the ceiling right up there. Now, I could not believe this worked. I boosted a handful of queens with about five Mexicanus pupae each, and then one day later, the very first queen had hatched out the first Mexicanus worker. As you can see, the queen is even feeding the Mexicanus worker right there. They're doing trophallaxis. The queen is absolutely huge. She's assumed the role of a replete. Um, this happens in Myrmecosystis queens during the first generation, essentially. Once the queens get their first workers, the workers will forage, gather up as much sweets as they can, and then they'll feed the queen, turning her into a replete since they don't have any repletes of their own yet. Those typically hatch out in the second or third generation. But yeah, I was able to get Myrmecocystis mendax to accept Myrmecocystis mexicanus workers, which is absolutely crazy because you see this queen, she's nearly all black, yet she has workers that are all yellow tending to her eggs down here. For some reason, some ant keepers are still against brood boosting despite all the benefits it can have. But as you can see, now the eggs are beginning to hatch into larvae. They have a couple down here, there's one there, and then a couple behind the worker, two, three, I see about four larvae so far. And the great thing that I was able to boost this queen now is that these workers will raise the larvae on their own with the queen having to do essentially no work at all, which not only helps the queen a lot, but it increases her chance of survival. Given that the boost worked, and now this Mendax queen has six Mexicanus workers tending to her and her brood, this queen will now be able to raise a much larger first generation of workers, since the Mexicanus workers can go out and forage for food, feeding both her and the larvae more than the queen would ever be able to do on her own. During the founding stage, fully claustral queens, such as this one right here, rely on their fat and energy reserves to raise their first generation of workers. This means that queens will digest their own wing muscles and pretty much use all of the energy they have stored up from their mother colony in order to lay eggs, then feed the larvae that hatch from those eggs, and then eventually hatch out those pupae, getting her first generation of workers. This, however, is obviously a very hard process because the queen is having to do all of the work, whereas now you can see the worker right there actually feeding a larvae through trophallaxis. So it takes a ton of burden off of the queen, and the workers are able to gather their own food rather than the queen relying on what she has stored. So it's a win-win situation, and I, I'm really amazed that this was able to work, that this queen was able to accept workers of not only different species, but a species that's not even really closely related at all. So I'm amazed by this, and it just goes to show that once again, these ants don't always behave in the way you'd expect them to, and it's always worth experimenting. Uh, that's You never find new stuff by sticking to the results that other people have already found. You're able to discover new stuff by experimenting yourself and trying things out every once in a while, which could re result in huge benefits. Another interesting observation is that the clutch of eggs that this queen laid is absolutely huge. Normally, a founding queen would not be able to lay this many eggs because, once again, she only has the energy she has stored to feed the larvae. So if she lays too many eggs, she won't be able to raise them all up successfully. But given that the workers are now foraging for food and feeding the queen, from the very, very start, she can lay way more than she would be able to do naturally. That's probably about 20 to 30 eggs just in the first generation. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and please let me know if there's any specific video ideas you guys would like to see. I'm having a lot of fun making these videos for you guys, documenting the growth of my queens, of my colonies, and just sharing it with everyone to see. If you did enjoy, please be sure to leave a like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching.